using his ultra-nationalist terrorist group known as the Ustashe, and he Pavelic orchestrated a horrific genocide of nearly one million ethnic Serbs, Jews, and Romani people. On October 9, 1934, King Alexander of Yugoslavia was assassinated in Marseille, France. The assassin was an agent of the internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, IMRO, but another group had been working behind. The scenes to orchestrate his death, the Ustashe, a Croatian ultra-nationalist regime led by an unhinged fascist named Andy Pavelic. After Axis forces conquered Croatia in 1941, Pavelic was installed as its Paglovnik, or head. Pavelic, much like his contemporary and friend Adolf Hitler, was a violent anti-Semite. In total, Pavelic helped orchestrate the murder of over 700,000 Jews, Romani, and Serbs during World War II. And his murderous reign ended only with the defeat of the Axis powers in 1945, after which Pavelic fled to Austria and Italy where he hid under assumed names until his death in 1959. Anti Pavelic was born on July 14, 1889, in Bradina. Bosnia Herzegovina. The son of a railroad foreman, Pavelic became a lawyer and joined the Croatian Party of Rights in 1910, a group that demanded an independent Croatian state from the growing Yugoslavian state. Yugoslavian history, as explored by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, is long and complicated, dating back to 1389 and the time of the Ottoman Empire. But the Yugoslav project as it came to be known, officially started in 1918 with the formation of the Yugoslav Union. A state comprised of parts of Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, and the former Turkish provinces of Kosovo, Mitohija, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and Macedonia. In short, it was set to be one of the most diverse populations in any European country during the period between World War I and II. Unfortunately, as history soon made clear, this was also a time that fostered racial hate, rampant nationalism, and genocidal regimes. As a result, the Yugoslav Union was never stable and faced constant threats internally and externally from terrorist separatists. Then, in 1929, apparently fed up with the constant, failed negotiations to unify Yugoslavia, Alexander Karadjordjevic, later known as Alexander I, or Alexander the Unifier, established a centralized royal dictatorship to restore parliamentary rule and ethnic autonomy. Pavelic openly denounced Alexander I's rule, declaring that he intended to fight against the Yugoslavian regime by all possible means. He took refuge in first Austria and then Italy, where he created the Ustache, or insurgent, movement. The Ustache underwent military training in camps both in Italy and Hungary while Pavela continued to work behind the scenes with fascist rulers. Five years later, having failed in his attempt to unify the state, Alexander I was assassinated in a plot devised by Pavela's Ustache, which was funded and sheltered by Italy, Hungary, and Bulgaria. A French court sentenced Pavela to death in absentia, but Mussolini sheltered Pavelic and refused to turn him over, instead only imprisoning him for two years. When the Germans invaded Yugoslavia on April 6, 1941, they initially asked Vladko Masic, the head of the Croatian Peasant Party, to take over the independent state of Croatia. But he declined. Axis powers then offered the position to Pavelic who had recently returned to the state from his Italian exile. The official slogan of the Ustache regime in Croatia was, Zadam Spremni, or Ready for the Fatherland. And although the state was technically independent, it was obvious to all that it was beholden to German and Italian demands. Pavelic, like his friend Hitler, was fiercely anti-Semitic and openly espoused fascism. When he took charge of Croatia, Pavelic immediately instituted the ruthless persecution of minorities living in the country, primarily Serbians and Jews. In fact, while speaking to an Ustashe student group at the University of Zagreb, the nation's capital, Pavelic declared that all enemies, all Serbs, Jews, and Gypsies, should be slaughtered. 
According to the Jewish Virtual Library, Pavelic's subservients arbitrarily arrested, deported, and killed thousands of innocent people. Destroyed Serbian churches, forcibly converted Serbs to Catholicism, and exiled Serbs, Jews, and Romani while stealing their property. Pavelic established the Yasenovac concentration camp where he rounded up the parasite minorities and had the Ustashe and Croat authorities slaughter them. He was so ruthless that even the Nazis referred to him as bestial. In addition to being violently ultra-nationalist, the Ustashe regime was also strictly Roman Catholic. They tolerated Bosnian Muslims as their religion, kept the Croat bloodline pure and granted Jews who converted to Catholicism the status of honorary Croats, those who didn't convert, however, were rounded up and shot, strangled, or beaten to death. German spies who had been established to watch over Pavelic even wrote to German SS leader Heinrich Himmler of the Ustache's methods of violence, stating that they were equally torturous to helpless old people, women, and children. Pavelic's men would reportedly gouge out children's eyes and hack them to death with shovels. They would hang men upside down, castrate them, then strangle them or allow them to be mauled by dogs. Altogether, the Ustache were responsible for brutalizing and massacring over 200,000 Serbs, 30,000 Jews, and 29,000 Romani people, in just one year between 1941 and 1942. Some estimates suggest they orchestrated over one million deaths, including 700,000 Serbs alone. Then, on April 30, 1945, Adolf Hitler died by suicide, leaving Pavelic and the Ustache without any sponsors. On May 9, 1945, the Ustache fought their last battle. Sensing defeat on the Austrian border, the force withdrew and attempted to surrender to the British. Naturally, the British refused. When the Ustache then gave themselves up to predominantly Serb partisans, all 40,000 of them were subsequently machine gunned and their corpses tossed into a ditch. Pavelic, however, was not among them. Instead, he and his senior officers appealed to the Vatican for help, citing their devout Roman Catholic faith, and despite their heinous crimes, the Vatican obliged granting them clerical passports which they used to escape to Argentina. Anti-Pavelic hid safely in Argentina, protected by the Perón regime until 1957 when he was found by a Serb partisan and then shot several times in the stomach. The gunshots didn't kill him, but he no longer felt safe in Argentina. He then fled to Spain, suffering from uncontrolled diabetes and unhealed wounds. Anti-Pavelic ultimately died in his bed at 70 years old on December 28, 1959, and many would argue it was too peaceful a death for a man that even the Nazis found cruel.